Welcome back to another volume of Truly Disturbing Tales from Reddit. Today we're going to be narrating three new unsettling stories taken directly from the platform. I encourage you all to sit back, grab a snack, and enjoy these terrifying personal accounts. Now, without any further delay, let's jump right in. Given our mutual enjoyment of frightening stories, I've decided to share one personal story that terrified me to the point of paranoia. For the record, I'm a 28-year-old male, and this happened just last year in a major southern U.S. city. Given the nature of what happened, I'm not fully comfortable sharing the precise city and locations. Given time, you'll understand why. My best friend Lauren and I took advantage of an extended weekend to visit several of our close friends whom had all moved to said city. For clarity, their names are Jacob, Jessica, Bailey, and Tim. Conveniently, they all live in the same house, which is important to this story. We had no shortage of fun and eventful moments Thursday and Friday, but Saturday night is where it all kicks off. We went to this arcade bar that had damn near every arcade game in history, plus all the new fighting games converted to arcade style. Jacob and I have a pretty mean geek streak, so this was pure bliss for us. Getting to dominate in Tekken, Injustice, TMNT, more Tekken. It was a dream come true. Lauren was also having a blast with us, but Bailey and Jessica were struggling to find enjoyment. Bless their hearts. Tim had to work a sudden night shift, so he wasn't with us then. Eventually, most of the group decided to grab an Uber to their favorite country and line dancing bar. I'd been before, and country just isn't my thing, so I stuck to the barcade. Eventually, Lauren decided to take an Uber to the country bar as well, as she'd never been and was curious. Planning to fully regroup at the country bar later when the barcade closed, we set up a group text and told Jessica and Bailey that Lauren was on her way and to meet her out front, since it was a massive place. And then, off Lauren went. I don't remember how much time had passed, but I received a text from Lauren telling me she couldn't find Bailey anywhere and that Jessica had already gone home. Jacob and I decided to drive over there, pick up Lauren, and head home ourselves. We just figured Bailey was with the guy she was interested in at the time. Hence, the radio silence. After the 20-ish minute drive to the bar, I called Lauren, told her we were out front, only for her to respond with, It's okay. I'm going to stay a while longer. Are you sure you want to stay? I asked. Yes. With no other option, I asked her to let us know when she's on her way back and to be safe. And then Jacob and I drove back to the house. Before I go any further, I want to describe the layout of this house. It's a traditional two-bedroom home with the office room having been converted for an extra bedroom. This house also had no curtains or blinds on any of the windows, and there are two massive windows in the living room looking out onto the main road. The converted office room has two French doors that open to the outside, and those are made up of glass windows themselves. In the backyard, there's a garage that has its own mini house attached to it. This is where Jacob lives, and I slept there for the weekend. Once we arrived back home, we had one or two more drinks, and at around 2.30 a.m., I got a text from Lauren saying she was on her way back. With that, I went to the futon and passed out. I was jolted awake by the sound of the door being burst open and somebody shouting at us. It was Bailey. She was the one shouting frantically demanding to know where Lauren was. My watch read 4.30, and I felt uneasy in my stomach. It took Jacob and me about 15 minutes to get home, so where the hell was Lauren? She hadn't answered or returned any of Bailey's calls. Jacob was so drunk that he couldn't stay awake, so it was on Bailey and me to try and find Lauren. I called her, and this time, luckily, she picked up. Having known her for 10 years, I could tell she was both highly intoxicated and scared, trying not to show it as best as she could. This, in turn, only scared me even more. 
asking the obvious question, where the hell she was, and if she was okay. She aggravatingly responds that she's fine, and in an Uber headed to the house. ETA? 15 minutes. I couldn't get any more information from her. She said she needed to hang up so she could use her GPS to get home, and quickly disconnected the call. But why would she need to use GPS if she was in an Uber? 15 minutes to the T, and no sign of Lauren arriving. I was ready to turn this whole town upside down, but called her one more time. She picks up, sounding just as agitated as the first time. But on this occasion, I hear more than one voice on the other end of the line before they all hush. As I start asking her all of the details of the Uber car, the driver, and any other passengers, she tells me it's a red Toyota sedan and she's three minutes out, hanging up once more, again abruptly. Not taking any chances, I quickly put on a shirt and pants, grab my two knives, ready for a potential mess with whomever these guys might be, and waited on the front porch. Bailey was waiting in the wings, ready to call 911 in the event that shit went south. Roughly three minutes later, a vehicle slowed towards our driveway. It was a white pickup truck. The passenger door opens, and out walks Lauren, exiting with haste, and not bothering to close the door or even look back. She didn't say a word to the driver. I could quickly see three other guys in the truck, but couldn't get any specifics before one of them closed the door. As we both rushed to Lauren's side to help her in, she was dead silent and slightly stumbling as she walked to the house. After what she told us, I have plenty of reason to believe that these guys may have been traffickers. One, she was all alone and lost in the bar when a guy came up to her and asked her to dance. When she agreed, another guy came and grabbed her phone and wallet with the excuse that it'll make dancing easier. How easy it'd be to check her ID and see she's not from the state, appeared to be alone. Plus, they could use that as a means to keep her from leaving. Two, they took her to a separate room where a bunch of guys had her drink a shitload of booze. She'd be too intoxicated to drive, but she wouldn't appear drugged, making it easy to slip past security under the guise that she's too drunk to drive, so we'll take her home. Three, they said they knew the address to which she wanted to go, but they knew a shortcut. Lauren's too smart to fall for that, which is why she pulled up her GPS. Once I called, they must have realized that people were already looking for her. After she told us all of this in the living room, we noticed that the truck hadn't moved, but only turned its headlights off. Once I turned the house lights off, they finally left. No couch for Lauren tonight. She was definitely sharing a bed with someone. We made sure that every single door and window was locked, and to call us and or 911 if anything went bump in the night. I went back to the garage house, only to learn that the front door doesn't properly lock. Like, what? The only brilliant idea I had was to place a bunch of empty beer cans from the weekend against the door. That way, we could all hear if the door even slightly opened. By this point, it was about 5 in the morning. Still no sun. Knife under my pillow. And back to sleep I went. I was pretty sure that the ordeal had passed but I was disturbed at the thought that these likely are dangerous people. And now, they know where my friends live. Not even an hour later, I woke again to a sound by the door. Sure enough, it was the sound of beer cans toppling over on the tile floor, followed quickly by the door being quietly shut. Knife in hand and ready to piss a river, I was confronted with two immediate choices check the window to see if anyone was outside fleeing, or check the interior for any intruders. I chose the latter, stupidly forgetting to call my friends or 911. I was both tired and scared. Jacob still hadn't budged from his bed, and I couldn't find the strength to yell at him to wake up and come with me. I just kept checking every room in every corner, underneath Jacob's bed and the garage, if the situation weren't already terrifying, that garage at night 
be a phenomenal prop for a horror movie. After concluding that Jacob and I were the only ones in the house, I checked the beer cans on the floor. It was not my imagination or a dream. The beer cans had definitely been pushed by the door. Someone had tried to get in. I looked out the window for the first time and found nothing out of the ordinary, but I gave whomever came snooping plenty of time to run or hide as I checked inside. Thinking only for the safety of my friends inside the main house, I made yet another stupid decision to step outside and check the perimeter. It was still incredibly dark out. The only light available was from a dim backyard light that perpetually stayed on. That, in addition to the flashlight on my phone. There were no cars at this time of night, no dogs barking, and I can't remember hearing any birds or insects. The silence itself was unnerving. I was waiting to hear footsteps, or breathing, or to see someone at every turn of my flashlight. But nobody was in the backyard. So I checked the windows and doors for any signs of disturbance that I could tell of. I could see directly into the office bedroom, which made me feel sick at the thought of someone with ill intentions peering in to see who was sleeping in that room. Fortunately, my search was anticlimactic, as I didn't find any sign of anyone sticking around. Regardless, I hauled ass back into the garage house, relieved myself, rearranged the beer cans in case someone were to try again, but this time, I stayed awake and alert until the adrenaline dump sent me off to sleep once more. When I woke up, my watch read 11.30ish, and as far as I know, nothing else happened. I updated a rather hungover Jacob about what went down less than 12 hours ago, to which he simply responded, Shit. I found it rather funny, given how highly strung I was while handling the situation. I didn't want to, but I asked everyone if they tried to get into the garage house after Lauren was back home. And of course, nobody said they did. I only told Jacob about my personal ordeal, in the hope that he would get that lock fixed. I didn't want to freak anyone else out more than they already were. Two months later, when Lauren and I came back to visit once more, that's when I told them everything. And I was most pleased to see that Jacob's lock had been fixed and that there are now blinds on every single window. Lessons learned, apparently. This is a story that I quietly remember to myself on occasion. It never really leaves my mind, just gets pushed down real deep before coming back to the surface. It comes from my childhood, it involves a couple of friends, and an act that still leaves me shaken. I grew up in the state of Arizona, Scottsdale to be specific, in the 90s and early 2000s. I attended Pima Elementary with a brother and sister named Brittany and Bobby. Brittany and I were the same age in the same grade. We were both on honor roll, and we played on the same basketball team together. Bobby was about two years younger than us, I believe. He didn't seem like the typical annoying little brother. Brittany always did her best to involve him, cared and looked out for him. Their mother Mary was a sweet woman and very involved with their lives and our school functions. We all even attended the same church together. The kids happened to be in the choir. Brittany was a typical preteen. She had a lot of friends, was funny, smart, and polite, as was Bobby. Typical kids. They were both a little shy when you first got to know them. Quiet, but always very kind, and everybody seemed to love them. I know people say this stuff all the time about others, but this is the honest to God's truth. They were really good kids. Their father, Robert came to some of our basketball games and sat all the way in the back of the stands, alone and silent, totally antisocial. My father tried to converse with him a few times, but to no avail. My dad didn't like Robert at all. He had these cold eyes that just seemed to look right past you, even when he was speaking to you face to face. He never cheered or congratulated Brittany. It seemed more like he had to be there than actually wanted to be. He honestly gave me the heebie-jeebies. 
you could tell he was a strict parent. Not a huggable guy that tells his kids that he loves them. He was a hunter, a military man, avid outdoorsman, and most importantly, seemed more than just a little bit sketchy. One day, it was a regular weekday morning. I was getting ready for school, and the news happened to be on. I was called into the living room where my parents were watching Breaking News. Live on our TV set was Brittany and Bobby's house, up in flames. At this point, no one knew if anyone was in the house, and I just remember praying that they were all safe. It took a while for the fire to be put out, but once it was, the news was grim. Mary, the mother, was found with a slit throat and a gunshot wound to the head. The kids, their throats were also cut. How scared they must have been still breaks my heart. The police said that they were found in their beds, so my hope and wish is that they were sleeping when this absolutely horrible act was committed. Robert, the father, was nowhere to be found as days went by. Our school was filled with grief counselors, and a lot of my classmates went by the house to pray for the family and place signs of remembrance there. It was a horrific shock to our community, and the news stations played it out for days on end. There was so much speculation as to what had happened. Robert's parents were in complete denial that he would do such a thing, and who could blame them? They insisted that someone else did it, and he must be in some sort of trouble. Some even speculated it had to do with some sort of gambling debt that he owed. Come to find out, Robert had cheated on his wife in the past. They had had some sort of argument the night before, although now... I'm not sure if that's what the fight was even about. But long story short, she wanted to leave him, and he just couldn't handle the thought of a divorce. His truck and his dog were found a week later in the Tonto National Forest, about 50 miles north of us. For those of you who may not have figured it out yet, the father in the story is a man named Robert Fisher, a guy that spent 20 years on the FBI's most wanted list in connection to the slaying of his wife, two children, and subsequently bombing their home in an attempt to cover up his crimes before disappearing himself. This whole situation is gut-wrenching and heartbreaking. What I still can't get over is the fact that he brought his dog along with him, but brutally murdered his children. It sickens me to my core. Needless to say, the police scoured the woods for days and didn't find a single piece of evidence as to where he could have gone. Some people think that he unalived himself, but some people, like myself, believe he's still out there on the run under an assumed identity. It would make me feel better to think that he was dead and rotting in the afterlife for what he did, but he was such a skilled outdoorsman, like I previously stated, that I believe he absolutely could have survived in those woods and gotten away. I even think he could have used the woods as a diversion for the police before he left and headed somewhere else. They never found his body, so it's not too hard to imagine. He could have fled to Mexico or anywhere, really, and could be living a carefree life somewhere else. I hope he's caught in his lifetime so that Mary's family can get closure and justice and this piece of shit can rot in prison where he belongs. But at the time of telling the story... He's yet to have been seen again. More than just a creepy encounter, this is a tragic story that touched all of our lives, and I'm glad that it still gets talked about today. I will never forget Brittany and Bobby. My story happened in Albuquerque, New Mexico, nearly 40 years ago now. I was in college at the time and had an apartment on the east edge of town. It was a fourplex and there were a couple of undeveloped lots nearby. I remember that it was around 9.30 that night and I was doing my laundry in my shared laundry room at the apartment. I needed quarters for the machine so I walked across this main road to the local 7-Eleven across the street. 
As I walked up to the door of the building, I see this big, ugly guy standing outside the door, just leering at me. My radar goes off, and I want to turn around, but I'm already walking, so I figure I'll just go inside and wait there until he leaves. As I walk in the store, that's when I see that that ugly guy has a friend buying something, and they have a white, windowless van, which happens to be the only vehicle in the area. Now, I'm really worried. I go inside and start strolling through the three aisles to wait them out. This action seems to raise the suspicion of the 7-Eleven clerk. He asks me if I'm going to buy anything. I tell him I need quarters, but I'm waiting for those guys outside to leave. The clerk asks me again. I tell him the same thing. And when he asks me the third time, then he tells me that I need to leave. The two creeps are still outside the door, now intently watching me. I tell the clerk once more, who happens to look around 17 or 18 years old. I tell him that I'm scared to go outside because of those guys. The clerk has now raised his voice at me and tells me that if I don't leave, he's calling the police. I say, yeah, great idea, call the police. Those guys are really freaking me out. But that's when the clerk says, I have a gun. I just stare blankly at him. Are you kidding me? I say. This kid looks so scared and shaken himself and has been watching me like a hawk, so he hasn't even noticed the brutes outside. Now I'm scared that the clerk is going to shoot me. Like, what in the actual f***? I look outside and don't see the guys anymore. Okay, I'll peek and see where they went. No sign of them. I step outside and start to walk back towards my apartment. As I start to make my way across the main road, which is a pretty wide one, I hear something from behind me. It's the ugly guy, now standing up from his crouched position behind some weedy shrubs in the empty lot next door to the 7-Eleven. I keep walking towards my building, but my front door is exposed and near the street. I don't want him to see which apartment I'm in, so I change direction and head towards my car. As I'm halfway across the street, that's when the big guy starts running at me. I can't turn around and make it back to the 7-Eleven. He's blocking that route. And now his pal is in the white van shouting instructions to him. I'm sprinting towards my car, and the big guy gets really close. He even brushed my back with his hand as he attempted to grab my hair. I make it to my car with a couple of steps to spare. I start it up and pull onto my street, intending to head to another store to yell for help. No cell phones at this time, obviously. Ugly guy now jogs onto my street and stands in the middle of the road just staring at me. His pal is now parked across my street in the van. I'm heading towards the ugly guy and I slow down. And as I slow, he gives me this head tilt and snort like he's got me cornered. I think many women have seen this head tilt. So infuriating. His stance in the middle of my road, his superior smile at me, and that stupid head nodding completely pisses me off. I punch the accelerator and head right towards him. It takes a minute for my old beat up car to respond, and he's still smiling at me when he realizes that I'm heading right for him. Now he turns tail and runs for my car, and his friend from the van is yelling at him to run faster. I keep at him. He runs up onto the sidewalk, and I follow him up over the curb. At the last minute, he dives behind a low cinder block wall. I don't want to hit the wall and stall my car, so I swerve away and head down the street to the 24-hour supermarket. Now I find myself shaking, so I can barely grip the steering wheel. I pull right up to the automatic doors of the store, park my car on the door sensor mat so the doors keep opening and closing. I am more determined than ever to get the police here. I'm furious and still terrified as I run into the store and scream for help. I yell to the manager to call the police while everyone just stares at me. Manager tells me to move my car. Now I'm completely pissed off at everyone's lack of response. I go past the manager and start to grab at his phone. That scares him enough to call the police himself. It takes nearly half an hour for the cops to show. 
They stroll in, look casually around. Manager points at me. I tell them plainly, two guys just tried to kidnap me. Follow me, I'll take you to them. I jump in my car and take off at high speed. Run the red light right outside of the grocery store. I figure that'll get the cops to chase me whether they want to or not. I head back to my apartment. My plan worked. The cops followed me. I stop outside my apartment and of course no one is around. They walk up to me, facing me, standing side by side. Just for reference, I was about 120 pounds. I'm 5 feet 7 inches tall and 20 years old at the time. Seemingly not a threatening presence to anyone. I'm facing them. I start telling them the story. As I get to the part about the ugly guy standing up from his crouched position, the younger officer of the two does that same head tilt back, followed with a snort, and says, Well, what were you wearing? Once again, what the actual f***? There's a moment of silence between us while I gape at the chauvinistic guy in uniform. Then, I absolutely lose it. I raise both my arms up and yell, This! This is what I was wearing. T-shirt and baggy jeans. As I yell this, mind you, I'm about six feet away from them. That same young officer reaches for his gun. Luckily, the other, more seasoned officer stops him with a hand to his partner's chest. I'm so shaken and disappointed at this time that I feel like I'm about to cry from frustration. But with all my strength, I don't. I yell at him. I yell, this is what I was wearing. Does this turn you on? Does this outfit mean I'm allowed to be attacked? What about your girlfriend? Your daughter? Your mom? Is that all okay? I'm actually screaming at the two of them at this point. I say, and what about those guys? How many other women have they grabbed like this? Anyone you know? I want to file a report. They say, okay. They both turn around, calm as can be, go to their car, get in and drive away. No report, no response, nothing. I'm simply left there standing. I still wonder to this day, almost four decades removed, how many other women those monsters grabbed and if they were ever caught.